Hello. It's nice to meet you. Welcome to Tokyo. Hmm? That house in front of you? Well, sometimes you can already tell the dark paths of our house just by looking at it from the outside. Come with me, we can explore together, and I will tell you everything that happened in this house along the way. This house stands in Tokyo, more specifically the Sedagaya district. It's a duplex, and the right sides belong to the Miyazawa family, with 44-year-old Mikio, 41-year-old Yasuko, 8-year-old Nina, and 6-year-old Rei living inside the home. On the 30th of December 2000, the whole family lost their lives by the hand of a killer who is still not found to this day, despite there being over 12,500 pieces of evidence. On the left lived the mother of Yasako, by the way, and she will be the one discovering the crime scene, but I'll tell you all about it later on. By the way, while we go inside, I gotta say that the story I will tell you is not for everybody. I will not show any sort of graphic images, but the topic may still disturb a few viewers as it is for a reason one of the most infamous cases in Japan, so just as a quick heads up. Alright, now that we are inside we have to take our shoes off. After all, this is Japan, and also, this is still a crime scene to this day. At around 11.30 p.m. on the 30th of December 2000, when the intruder entered the home, most of the family was already sleeping. Only the father, Mikio, was still awake and sitting in front of his computer on the ground floor. They had two computers, one for the father who worked from home, and the other one was sometimes used for the mother's cram school or for the kids to study on. There was also a big bookshelf and a drawer where many documents were stored. The other family members were sleeping upstairs. Let's actually make our way upstairs for now to show you the rather complex layout of the house and I'll show you where everybody was during the break-in. The corridor on top of the stairs is actually where daughter Nina and mother Yasuko would end up, but we aren't quite there yet. In the bathroom right here is where the murderer took his first steps inside the house actually. He supposedly climbed up to the window above the bathtub, took the window cover off and climbed inside. He most likely chose this window because it's easy to access by a quick climb and he was protected by the trees of the Shoshigaya Park from anyone who could be spotting him climbing inside. After we made our way out of the bathroom, we can see the toilet to the left. We will visit it later because it also holds important pieces of evidence. When we go to the right, we can see the children's room, where Ray was sleeping during the attack and that's also where he would be found later. Ray was the killer's first victim. But we will come back to that later. For now, I show you the rest of the house, which is also very significant to what happens. From the corridor, there are two ways up. One is to the parents' bedroom in the roof, and the other one leads to the kitchen and the living room. We now make our way into the living room after turning right. After turning right, we can see the kitchen that also holds a few pieces of evidence, and the main living room with a couch, TV, and a dinner table. The killer actually slept on the couch for some time and left a lot of pieces of clothing lying there around as well. Then there's the roof where Yasako and Nina were watching TV. To get up there, you have to climb a foldable ladder which is located between the toilet and the bathroom. It is unclear if the ladder was usually closed or open when someone was upstairs and if it was during the attack. Most likely the mother and daughter closed the entrance uh, to the roof to hide from the killer, but he opened it up again. There is not a lot in the roof besides the bed for the parents, a TV and for later a few pieces of evidence. As I told you before, the perpetrator made his way inside the house through the bathroom window, taking the window cover off leaning the cover onto the fence and climbing inside. First he mounted the fence, then he pulled himself up on the water heater that was to the left of the window and went head first through the window. How he did that without making too much noise is unknown, but he probably was just very careful. He 
Here you can see the area again with a better overview and in daytime. Afterwards he was looking around. We don't know if the killer just heard the computer downstairs where the father was working and the TV upstairs and decided to go into the closest room which happened to be the children's room or if he knew the layout of the house and went directly to the children's room due to them possibly being the targets. So he made his way in there and strangled Ray who was sleeping in the bed. He passed away and became the killer's first victim. The attack probably made some noise that the father noticed and shouted the boy's name upstairs to see what was going on. After not getting an answer, he tried to make his way up to the boy, but he got caught by the killer when he turned the corner. They had a quick fight on the stairs until the suspect took out a sashimi knife he brought with him and he attacked the father with a vicious attack that left the father dead with a broken piece of blade stuck in his head on the bottom of the stairs. It is unknown if the killer went directly to the kitchen to get a new knife or if he tried to attack the mother and daughter first but the most plausible path is that he went into the roof to attack them but realized that the sashimi knife wasn't useful anymore as the blade broke and went to the kitchen to get another knife. That gave the mother and daughter a short time to take care of their wounds and when they tried to escape they got caught after climbing down the ladder and the mother Yasuko and daughter Nina ended up here in the corridor below. Now we come to the part that is always standing out compared to other crimes and is still baffling investigators. Instead of leaving the home immediately, he stayed for 2 to up to 10 hours and acted as if it was his home. He used the toilet without flushing, he changed clothes and even left many of those clothing pieces behind. He took a nap on the couch, he used the family computer at 1.18am, created a new folder and visited a movie theater website, he treated his injuries and took different things out of the fridge like 4 bottles of barley tea, melon and ice cream. He went through many more drawers and papers and took about 150,000 yen but also left some money behind. And only after all that he went back to the window he came from, made his way down the same path and ran away from the house, never being seen or caught by anyone. On the next day at approximately 10am the grandmother, who like I said lived next door, came over. She had no idea what occurred as she only heard a few bumps at night and was rightfully shocked when she saw what happened. She immediately ran out and called the police. The grandmother is also the reason why the police is unable to determine the time the killer left the home, as she apparently bumped into the table on the way out and moved the mouse so it turned on the computer. The police still believe the suspect left at around 1.18am when the last connection before the one at 10am occurred. It's either that or the suspect left right before the grandmother came into the home which is a very scary thought. Inside the house the police found 12,500 pieces of evidence with a large number containing significant evidence like blood, saliva or fingerprints. Also, some of the biggest clues about the suspect's identity were found on his clothing. He most likely changed clothes after the attack and he left certain items behind. A hip bag, which was sold between 1995 to 1999 and only ever produced in Osaka, Japan. The circumference of the bag was set to 83 centimeters, making the waist 70 to 75 centimeters. Inside the bag was sand. Interestingly, sand has different compositions depending on geology and environment, so you can pin down an approximate location. The sand that was found in the bag was allegedly from the Edwards Air Force Base in California, which would make a military background very likely. I say allegedly here because the original Japanese news reports merely stated southwestern America as a possible origin, and the Air Force Base could have been a result of a bad translation. Also, the bag could have been easily bought second-hand or was used by the killer in a travel and that's how the sand got into it. Another thing wrongfully reported was sand from a skate park or even grip tape for skateboards inside the bag, which were never stated in the original Japanese news reports. But there's one thing that was found in the bag. There are stains inside the bag that come from a red highlighter pen, as you can see here. 
the police identified shoes through footprints as Schlesinger that had a Korean shoe size and they were produced in Korea between October 1998 and November 2000. These were either high top or low top ones. The shoes were 27.5 cm in length. A limited edition sweater sold between August 2000 and December 2000 with only 130 of them ever sold and 12 buyers were ever identified but none were suspicious. Black handkerchiefs sold between 1995 and 2000 and sold in Japan. One of those handkerchiefs was found with a hole inside, most likely for a better grip when holding the knife. This is a trick very common amongst hunters, military personnel and fishermen. The bag and handkerchief smelled like Dracar Noir, a perfume produced in France, which was sold and was very popular in Japan and among skaters and was on sale since 1982. This jacket that was sold from October 2000 to after the murder happened. A hat that was sold between July 1998 and November 2000 in Japan. A scarf with sadly unknown origin as the tag was missing. Edwin gloves manufactured and sold between 1998 and 2000. And the knife he brought with him was identified as a sashimi knife made in June 2000 and sold in Japan. The length of the blade is 21 cm. Out of all these items, the sweater is the most significant one as it is by far the rarest. The sleeves are light purple, the body color is light gray. The sizes on sale were large and medium and large sweaters were the only sizes sold. It was sold in a store called Marufuru. Also the gloves and the hats were sold and bought at the same store. The knife interestingly was unused before the attack and was seemingly bought solely for the attack. Surveillance cameras were checked at certain stores, but nothing of note ever came from it. The police thought they had a trace when a knife from the same brand was bought in a store 5 kilometers away and only a day before the attack, but the DNA found that the store did not match the one at the crime scene. Other pieces of evidence were found in odd places with a possible deeper meaning behind it. There were documents removed from their original position and found somewhere else in the home. On the roof where the mother was watching TV with the daughter, a document about the mother's cram school that the mother did from home was found and it's a possibility that the suspect wanted to talk or confront the mother with the document. But it could be that the police officers misplaced it by accident as it wouldn't be the first time a piece of evidence gets misplaced by officers before forensic scientists come to the house. Another theory about the document is that the mother left it there before anyone even came into the home, but still, this document could lead to a motive and it was looked into, but there was no student that raised any suspicion. Other documents from the mother's cram school and some from the father's work were taken from a drawer on the ground floor and found in a bathtub together with keys, ice cream and a towel with the suspect's blood on it. The theory is that maybe he wanted to soak it all to reduce the evidence and just never did that. But that doesn't make sense when there are many other pieces of evidence in the house that he didn't care about. One thing mentioned in Japanese forums is that there could be a deeper meaning behind it and the perpetrator tried to be disrespectful by throwing his trash together with the family documents. Another thing deemed very disrespectful in Japan is getting changed in the main living room, which the suspect did. Not flushing the toilet after using it is also deemed very disrespectful, but that's not solely a thing for Japan. The most plausible explanation for all the trash in the bathtub is the fact that the killer wanted to leave through the window he came in and also tried to be undetected from anyone walking past the house on the street, so he did most of the things hidden from the downstairs windows. The feces were also an important piece of evidence as they included DNA and it was also discovered that the person ate a sesame spinach dish with string beans before the attack. The DNA found at the crime scene also included some information about the murderer. He was 1 meter 70 tall, had type A blood, had black or dark brown hair, he was right-handed at the time of the attack, he was between 15 to 35 years old at the time of the attack. The suspect is most possible of mixed race, with the father being East Asian and the mother being South European. 
And also there's a certain part in the DNA that it's making it more likely for him to be half Korean than half Japanese. With these details and with other pieces of evidence, the investigators were able to create possible profiles. Because of the DNA evidence and that the shoes had Korean sizes, it was speculated that the murderer was Korean, but that's not very damning evidence due to the fact that he could have easily bought those shoes online or bought them on a trip to Korea, leaving only the DNA as a possible sign of Korean heritage, but the DNA makes it only more likely and not 100% certain that he's Korean. Another fact that makes the Korean theory unlikely is the number of other items found that were all produced and bought in Japan. But what's interesting is that the police couldn't determine a person's fingerprints. In Japan, only criminals have their fingerprints taken and between 1993 and 2007, Japan did not record fingerprints from Korean nationals entering the country. The same goes for people from other nations who entered between April 2000 and November 2007. So it could be possible that the killer came into the country during that time and that's the reason the police couldn't find anyone with those fingerprints. Another rather unlikely profile is the killer being a half French skater. As mentioned before, the mother of the killer was South European, so France wouldn't be unlikely. And also the perfume was made in France and was apparently used by many skaters at that time. There is a theory that the father of the Miyazawa family had an altercation with someone at the skate park because they were too loud, and the person killed the family as a consequence. In the Daily Journal, by the father, nothing of that sort ever happened, and it would also be a very extreme response to kill someone because of an altercation. Another thing is the ingredients found in the feces are known in Japan as a classic meal mothers do for their children, suggesting that the suspect was very young or at least still living at home. But that would mean that the mother isn't from France, or she lived in Japan for a long time to adopt some traditions. What sounds like the most plausible suspect at first is a son from a military family, or the killer being in the military himself, as he could be stationed in Japan. The sand, if the report said it comes from the Edwards Air Force Base in California are true, would also start making a lot of sense. Other things like only clicking and not typing on the family computer because of the killer, maybe not understanding the Japanese on a keyboard would also make a lot of sense. Further, the family had a Japanese toilet with many buttons. Japanese toilets are rather complicated and it would make sense as a foreigner to not being able to flush but it is also rather a sign of disrespect by the killer as it happens very frequently that murderers go to the toilet in a victim's home and don't flush. As I said before, one of the handkerchiefs had a hole in the middle to probably wrap it around a knife to have better grip. It was likely used like we see in this video by the Japanese police. They suspect that it was used like this to protect from injuries while cutting up fish in the fish industry, or it is also used by the Philippines military for combat purposes. So is it a guy from the military that travels to different military bases in the world and when he came to Japan he wanted to kill a family? Uh, not very likely, because when we look at the sashimi knife it is not very good for attacking someone. Hence the blade broke and it also injured the killer's hand in the process. Also, there is no combat experience if he struggled with the family before taking out the knife. So, when we add up all the evidence, it seems like the killer is a young boy who grew up in Japan and has parents or at least a mother from outside of Japan. He either never committed a crime like this or in general, and so his fingerprints are not in a database. His clothing is all Japanese except the shoes. The food in his feces is a traditional food in Japan and he might know Japanese and was just clicking on the computer instead of typing something. A child from a military family actually seems the most likely from the profiles I showed you. A child from a military family that lived in Japan for a long time and grew up there but the parents come from other countries originally and they settled down in Japan after being stationed there. Also, do you remember the bag? As I mentioned before, there was red paint from a highlighter pen inside the bag and it could be because he used a highlighter pen for school or university. He seems like an immature or young person that just wanted to kill and get some money from it and saw this kind of remote house in the middle of Japan and acted out what he wanted. Rather disgustingly, he might have done it for sexual pleasure as well, targeting the mother or even the daughter, but there is no indication for it, but it could still be a possible motive.
There is the theory that the killer never came inside the home through the window, as the clothes that were found were still in pristine condition and that there weren't any strings or other particles found at the entry points. But the wounds on the father's body suggest that he was attacked by someone in a higher position than him, so getting attacked on the stairs and falling down afterwards makes the most sense. Also one of the neighbors stated on his first interview that he heard the Miyazawa doorbell late that night, but later when the police asked him again about it, he said it was a misunderstanding and he didn't hear anything. So there is no proof for either entry point, but that he entered through the window makes more sense than the door theory. So, after all that, after 246,000 investigators worked on a case, and some of them still researching, after 12,500 pieces of evidence were found, and after 22 years of searching, there is little hope that the killer will ever be found. But there is still a glimmer of hope, because in 2010, Justice Minister Kei Kojiba enforced a new law which renders the statute of limitation for murder and similar crimes that could result in life in prison useless. This is very important due to the fact that the killer could still be prosecuted even after 2015, which you know keeps the desire to find the killer alive. The big problem with this case is that we don't know so many crucial things like the motive. We don't know the intrusion route, we don't know the escape route, we don't know the precise intrusion time, neither the escape time, and we don't even know if it was a group offense or not. So the only possible way to solve this murder is if someone comes forward with information. And that's what this video is for, to get the information to some people out there in the hope someone remembers something and justice can be served. Well, thank you for watching, what an intense case, I still hope that the suspect will be found at some day. You know, it's uh, at first it's really interesting to see a case and research about it, but um, once you know you see the the mother of Yasuko still searching for the killer to this day to have justice served, it's, it's sad to see, you know. And yeah, it's a hard. Vi it was a hard video to make, but if maybe someone remembers something, you know, when someone was at that time in Japan and they saw a suspicious person with those items running around or buying those items and they forgot about it and now they live in America or something that would be really helpful if someone could find anything about this case, if they have any information. So yeah, thank you for watching again and if you have any other suggestions for videos you can write it in the comments and I would love to discuss this case with you in the comments and yeah, hope I see you next time.